Oh, <laughs> I was like, some peace. Come on, come on, come on. Well, good morning, Sharks. You know, it's been an awesome service so far. I want to thank you, Stevie and Cicero, for sharing your hearts with us this morning. Uh, I felt like I went on a little bit of an emotional roller coaster. You know, Stevie brought me before the cross, and I was very humbled. And then Cicero brought me up and, and gave me a gift. I was so fired up. But before we get into the, the lesson this morning or the sermon this morning, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we are so grateful and thankful to be here this morning. Lord, we know that you allowed us to uh, rely on our spirits a little bit extra this morning as we, some of us missed an hour of sleep, Lord. But some of us planned ahead, Lord, and that was amazing. as well. Lord, we're so grateful to be here and be able to just talk about you. And, and, and Lord, that you would even allow me to preach is so humbling and so amazing, Lord. I pray that you move me aside. And you speak through me and not, not allow my words to be what your people hear, but only what you want your people to hear. Yes, Lord, I'm so grateful for what you're doing in this, this outer west region. And I love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, this week's been an awesome week. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. This Wednesday, we got to go share for Women's Day. Wow. And uh, I got to go to Yorktown Mall and, and we saw Cicero and and all the brothers studying the Bible with somebody. And then, and then we kind of broke up in all these little groups. And then the, the security guards told us we couldn't share our flyers. And we're like, man, what the heck's going on here? But you know what? It means it must have been effective. Amen. <laughs> but let us uh, talk about what we learned last week. You know, last week we had our, our brother uh, AJ come up and, and preach about unconditional love. Amen. And I don't know about you guys. I was fired up. I was like, man, I, I love me some love, you know. But why? Because, because love is this thing that is, is so hard at times to attain, but when you get it, it just feels so good. Yeah. But you know what's so amazing about God is, is God really is, is, is the, the, the most freely in, in his love. He gives so freely in his love. He's so quick to, to give us his love. And, and that's what really AJ talked about last week mm. is God's love for us. But because of that, God also calls us to love yeah. mm. and you know a lot of the times we, we can talk about debt and we're like oh debt that's a bad word <laughs> <laughs> somebody's like hey i'm in debt bro you're like "Ooh, you're a debt amen but the bible does teach about a certain type of debt yep and it's the debt that we're going to talk about today come on let's turn our bibles to romans chapter 13 in uh, verse 8 come on brother now this sound may sound familiar if you came last week but i'm going to give us a little bit of a reminder Come on, bro. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. And it says this. Let no debt remain outstanding mm. except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Come on. So that's the title of my lesson this morning. The title of my lesson is simply Love Debt. Mm. Another way to ask how to fulfill the law was to ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Mm. And as you can only inherit, etern only inherit eternal life if you fulfill the law. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Come on. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, we see something very interesting. In verse 25, it says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. Come on. How is love measured though in the bible you may be asking yourself that question well i'm glad you asked we're going to look at another scripture to de to define how to how do we figure out how to measure our love amen let's go to first corinthians chapter 13 and uh you guys may be familiar with this scripture at least i hope you guys have we've been talking about it almost in every sermon now but first corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 it says love is patient Love is kind. 
It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is, it is not, or it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. My favorite part, love never fails. Hmm. The question for us this morning is, is your love debt so high that you can go and say to somebody that you owe me these things? That you owe me some, some kindness. You owe me some patience. <laughs> You owe, me, you owe me all these things, but with no envy or boastfulness or no pride. Mm. Is that how the, the, the level that you're loving people? Mm. The only debt that should increase is the debt of love. And this has been translated to one common phrase, unconditional love. Oh. It means there's no limit to how much love you receive from others. You know. AJ gave us this analogy last week that there's, you know, the, the, the Amex or the American Express black car that has no, that has no limit on it. You guys, you guys would, would all be delighted to have that, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody gave you said, hey, you can spend whatever you want. There's no limit. You would, I'm sure some of us would go and swipe it away, right? But then you get that bill and you're like, oh, what was I thinking? Why did, I, why did I buy the private jet? I don't have enough money to afford this. But it's, it's interesting because if you have the, the love black card, if you will, yep. Come on. it means you can never hit that limit. You can always keep giving more love. And it's amazing. Because I don't know about for you guys, but sometimes... When, when, when you go and give that love, it comes back to you and you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. And it's just amazing. But I love how the scripture states that love never fails. But then it kind of calls us to question something. Has our love failed recently? And if your love has failed, who do you blame? Is it the, the fault of, of God's love? Is God's love all of a sudden flawed because it failed? Mm. or is it us did we fail the stand did we fail to meet the love requirement mm. you know sometimes i think it can be very easy for us to look at unconditional love and be like i expect <laughs> unconditional love <laughs> but then somebody's like yeah me too i expect that too and you're like how selfish <laughs> dare you ask me to give you unconditional love isn't that crazy that we're so, we so want, want it so badly, but we don't give it away freely. So let's figure out how we stay in unconditional love this morning. Or in other words, how can we stay in love debt this morning? By focusing on three main practices. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm probably going to focus on more of two. And the third one will kind of pass on to next week. Amen. But point number one is debt for God. Does your love for God match the love that God put into you or put in for you? It says God is love. But let's go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8. Where we see something very interesting. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 says this. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Hmm. Man, that's, that's convicting right there. Sometimes we're like, I know God. We, we, go, we go to campus, we go to our work, and like, man, my coworkers don't know nothing about Jesus. Or we go on campus and we're like, man, these groups don't know anything about God. <laughs> but then we miss this very mark. We miss the mark of love. And then we can very quickly go, oh, but that's not what God meant. God didn't mean love like that. Are you kidding? God went out of his way to love all the people of the world. He loved us at our worst. He gave his one and only son and himself to show his love for us. He put himself in a love debt that took 
his very life. In fact, his eternal life. And the debt that the scriptures asked you to pay forward is the debt of increasing love. In verse 9, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. God loved us so very much that he wanted us to make it to the finish line. He wanted you to inherit eternal life, even though none of us deserve it. That's how much he loved us. He came down on this earth to give us the cheat code. You know, I know some of us uh, play video games in here. I know Garrett and, and Paul and Chris play video games. And yesterday we were moving some stuff and they started talking about Skyrim and I was never so lost in my life. They were, they were like talking like a mile a minute. I was like, man. But you know, in, in, you guys I'm sure have, have played video games before. Yeah. And I know for me, when I was growing up with my little brother, the most infuriating thing was when my little brother would put some like random cheat code in the game. So he just got way better. Me and my brother would play like basketball on, on the Xbox or like football, and he would figure out ways to make the, the things way easier for him. And, and then I'd be like, what the heck's going on? There's no way you're beating me by 52 points in the first quarter. And then he'd go, I'm just, I'm just that good. He put the cheat code in. I wasn't expecting that, but that's what Jesus did for us. He put the cheat code in for us so that we may inherit eternal life. God's love is shown by God as he created a plan to unite us as one with Jesus. To show love, it must be willing and always, and, and love must always be that way as well. It must be unconditional. It must be Humble to, the, to a standard that is higher than the one than what you deserve. But do you love unconditionally? Do you love the way that Jesus did? Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Come on, Quentin. And we're going to pick it up here in verse 5. Where it says this. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, by being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Remember that Jesus had equality with God, that Jesus was in heaven with God and that he made a decision to come down. Mm -hmm. That's how much he loved. Him. He chose to become a servant and chose not to use his equality as a point of advantage while walking on earth as a man. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Come on, brother. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So Jesus, the creator, chose to become one with the creation. Mm in order to show, an, uh, to show us a physical, physical example of how to love. Come on. Jesus was, was so incredibly humble. You should, you know, he wasn't prideful and he didn't say things like this. You should know better. I created you. But he chose to teach us the standard as he understood we never saw it or taught, or we never saw it or taught so, or taught so on how to, do, how to hold this standard. So my question is, do you hold people to an unspoken standard of love 
or do you hold them to a standard that Jesus set? Because I think it's very easy at times to go, you should know better. Instead of showing people through the scriptures and through your own example of how to love. I'm going to give you guys a, a, a brief illustration here of how a father, a, a, of a father, God speaking with Jesus. Have you guys ever played with uh, like Play-Doh or like clay or anything like that? I remember, when, I remember when I was a little kid, I used to play with Play-Doh and I would, I thought I was a real artistic guy. I probably just had a ball and gave it a name. Maybe it was Bob or something. And, and you know, some, sometimes you, you, you think that you're a real artist. You're like, wow, I made a little man, a little stick figure and he, he's my creation. And I'm sure you love that, that little guy that you made. I know I did. Sometimes I didn't play with Play-Doh. Sometimes I just played with rocks. I was like, ah, oh, my pet rock. But I loved my pet rock. But I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Maybe you had a sibling or a friend come over and is like, what is this? And you're like, that's, uh, that's my, my, my pet Bob or whatever. And then they, they either they, they squish it. And they're like, take that. Sometimes my, 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 my brothers would like throw the rock. I'm like, oh, come on. Like, oh, there he goes. But would you be mad if somebody did that to you? Yeah, absolutely. Of course you would. You'd be like, what is your problem? Why would you do that? But of course you'd be upset because you made the person, the little person. You created them. But now let's imagine for a second us putting ourselves in God's shoes. God walks up to Jesus and asks him, Jesus, do you love mankind? And Jesus responds, yes, of course. I created that. God responds, well, me too. <laughs> but as you know, mankind has allowed sin to come into the world. And they will die as long as they, or they, they will die as they no longer have eternal life. As, and as you know, I can't live among sin. But there is a way to bring them back to be with us in eternal life. Jesus responds, how? You have to become part of mankind by being born a man. Walk among them for 30 years to show them an example of how to live. Then become the high, their high priest and the lamb of God a perfect, unblemished sacrifice a sacrifice in order to have their sins forgiven. As you know, if there is no blood, there is no forgiveness to abolish eternal death. We will need to exchange it with eternal life. And there is no other being besides yourself that can pay eternal debt as the payment requires an eternal life. Do you love mankind enough to give up your eternal life? Live among sin, die for them in order for them to have a path towards salvation and eternal life back with us. As you guys know, Jesus answered with a yes. Yep. Yeah. Wow. But I don't know about you, but that sounds crazy. And yet, why do people do these crazy things? Well, I'm sure you guys have heard the saying. People do crazy things for those they love. And what, and, and we see that what Jesus did. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, it says, again, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He set the example of love that he held to himself and called others to follow. Follow. So let's look at two more examples that Jesus set while walking among us. Debt for your family and debt for the lost. Now, let's not forget that Jesus' standard was above the old standard. And the old standard called you to love your neighbor as yourself. But we now remember that Jesus said, hey, that's, 
well and good and all, but now you must love your neighbor as I have loved you. Jesus' standard of loving his neighbor was to love them the way that Jesus and God loved them. Jesus raised the standard from a love set by un- uh, uh, from a love set by conditions to a love set by unconditional love. Luke chapter 10, verse 27, you don't have to turn there. It says, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That was the, that was the standard. But then Jesus came in John 13, verse 34 to 35 and said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that set a new standard of loving family and loving the lost. Point number two, debt for your family. In the first century, it was a custom that if the husband or the father of the household died, that it would become the son's job to take care of his mother. That was no different in Jesus' family. And, you know, have you guys ever wondered what happened to Mary when Jesus died? Well, there are many commentaries based on the absence of Joseph in the scriptures. After Jesus' childhood, that perhaps Joseph passed away, which would mean that Jesus, Mary's son, was responsible to take care of her. The unique part about it was that Jesus knew he wouldn't be able to do that. Physically. So he, could, so he made sure that, he, that a man adopted his mother and his mother that, uh, as his mother and that his, that, the, the, I'm sorry, that the mother adopted him as, his, as her son. I'm sorry. Jesus gave Mary over to his spiritual brothers. And if you're a brother, you're a family. And if you're a family, you fulfilled the law. Jesus never left his mother unloved. In fact, as we remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, it states that love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Without those things, love will absolutely fail. And, you know, sometimes I think we can find it hard to love our families. We can, we can look at our families and, and look at all the ways that our family hurt us. And I'm not here to say this morning that your family hasn't hurt you, because I'm sure they have. I know I've hurt my family, and I know my family has hurt me. But, I, but, but they don't understand. Well, I'm sorry. They don't, so some of us don't love our families because they hurt us but they don't understand us. And Mary never really understood Jesus. In fact, if you look in the book of Mark, you see that there was a time where, where Mary thought that Jesus was out of his mind. And she was like, look, I'm, you're coming home with me, son. <laughs> and then Jesus Mary made it very clear to Mary that, hey, look, you can come with me, but I'm not going with you. I'm with my family. I'm with my spiritual family. <clears throat> and you could imagine as the mother of Jesus, how much that must have hurt Mary. Mm-hmm. Man, you, you, you're just putting these random people above me after everything we've been through. And if Mary, who was encountered by an angel, knowing that Jesus had to come and do this, still struggled with Jesus' walk at times, mm-hmm. how much more should we expect that there will be times where our family struggles with our decisions? Yeah. Yeah. 
that they might just not get it. They may just be like, what, is, what are you thinking? How could you do this? But yet, it actually states here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, it's true that Jesus made a distinction, distinction, like I stated before, between his spiritual and physical family, but he loved them the same, unconditionally. Jesus never left his family just out hanging out in the drive. He made sure they were taken care of. Luke 14, verse 26, a lot of us know this scripture, but it says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And yet this seems like a contradiction. Unless you realize that the word hate here doesn't mean hate like in the English definition. In the Greek, it means more of a phrase of sacrifice to love. Which makes sense. Jesus was asking those who followed him to sacrifice the standard of love they have for their family, even themselves, and to put on a new standard of love that was based on Jesus. Yeah. Remember, Jesus' standard of love was as it reads. A new, in, in John 13, verse 34 through 35, it says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. So this scripture in Luke 14 makes a lot more sense when you, when you look at it in that lens. That Jesus wasn't saying, hey, all of a sudden, now you got to make your family think that you hate them. No, of course not. <clears throat> no, he wants you to love them into the kingdom of God. Because Jesus was the only one who had true unconditional love. Amen. Yeah. And if the standard was himself, then love your neighbor as yourself meant to love everyone as Jesus loved you. In Luke chapter 10, verse 27, it says this. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now this takes us to our third point. Debt for the lost. Remember... That the passage we, were, we are looking, above, looking at before that referenced his standard was written as an answer by the teachers of the law to a question of how, your, how, how to love your neighbor. And during this interaction, it prompted Jesus to teach on the parable of the Samaritan. And if you look at the parable of the Samaritan, it teaches us how far we should love our neighbor which is anyone who is half dead and teaches us how much debt that love took. Point number three, debt to the lost. Come on. Turn your Bibles over to Luke chapter 10, verse 28. Luke chapter 10, verse 28. And it says this. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to, go, to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass on the other side, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. When I return, I will reimburse you. For any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Come on. Do you love the lost like this? 
Would you lay down your life? Would you inconvenience yourself for the lost? You know, sometimes I think we can, we can talk about how much we love the lost, how much we want to help people, right? But sometimes we can fall victim of becoming like the priests and Levites in this story. Where we see somebody and we're like, oh, I got somewhere to be. Or maybe, maybe the priest would have looked around and was like, oh, good, there's no one here. Let me go on the other side. Because they didn't have to fulfill their obligation. Maybe, maybe for us, it's when we're not around other disciples or we're not around our disciple, it's going to be very easy to go, oh, well, you know, I'm sure they'll find a way. Instead of doing what the Samaritan did and being willing to lay down our life. And you see that, that Jesus was, was more than willing to lay down his life for us. And I think oftentimes we can forget that we were once the man who was beaten by the robbers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I so appreciate Stevie sharing her heart this morning for a communion. And it always causes me to reflect on where I come from, where I came from. And how it was, it can be so easy for me at times to go, oh, I was so easy to convert. Man, they had no problems with me. But then I go back and I talk to the people who studied the Bible with me. They're like, bro, you were super hard to convert. You were super hard hearted. And I was like, amen. Tell me out, bro. I remember I would I would come to service, a Sunday service like this one, and I would I would sit in the second or third row and I would hear somebody preach the word, I would hear a communion, and I would I would hear a contribution and every Sunday. And my heart was so hard, it was like it would bounce off me quick. Wouldn't even wouldn't even get a chance to get in my heart. The person, somebody would come up to me after the service, what do you think? And I was like, oh, that's cool, you know. I think I'll take something away from that. And then they'd be like, bro, do you want to study the Bible? And I'm like, no. Oh, I wasn't ready. But yet sometimes we study the Bible with people. And, and, and maybe their, their heart isn't quite there. And it can be so easy for us to go, ah, yeah. well, I did my best. Instead of loving them the way that you were loved. I know for me, I had to be studied with like four, five, six times just to get in the waters. I was a pain in the neck, as you would say. And that's coming from a kingdom kid who was in the ICOC. So I started studying the Bible at 13, and I didn't really get saved till I was 21. That was eight years of God working on my heart. But yet, sometimes somebody takes like an extra week, and we're like, man, what is their problem? Sometimes... Somebody in our, in, our, in our group isn't doing the best spiritually. And we can quickly forget the times that we were weak and we needed to be strengthened. Yeah. And we can just look at them with such, uh, such righteous smugness and be like, mm. <laughs> what is your deal? <laughs> no, we need to be like the Samaritan yes. who looked at the man and said, hey, let me help you. Yeah. But didn't just do the bare minimum. You know, he could have just left the money and been like, I'm not going to No, this man said, I'm going to come back and whatever extra I owe, I will pay that too. Wow. You could imagine the man who was beaten after hearing what had been done for him. He was probably, oh my goodness, this guy, awesome. Got to meet this man. How much more should we be doing that for the people in our lives? Come on. For our families. You know, I think a lot of us have prayers to save our family. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when your family asks you to come do something for them, what is your response? Yeah. You know, I think about that often. I remember there were some times when, when I was a young disciple and my mom or my, my grandma or, or somebody in my family would be like, hey, bro, can you come help me with this? And I'd be like, yeah, I'll come help. But in my heart, I was like, man, why? Why do you keep calling me? And I had to remember Oh, well, it's because I'm a disciple. Mm -hmm. I should be willing to help at a moment's notice. Yeah. And those are the, the very times that God's going to allow you to move in someone's heart. Yeah. yeah. By, by, by serving them. Yeah. If you serve somebody, they're, they're going to be much more inclined to hear about, about your, your Bible group and all that other yeah. stuff. But yet sometimes we can get very 
inward focus mm -hmm. and forget about the lost. Mm -hmm. Come on, Come on. But we must always help people find you. Yeah. In closing, I have uh, three challenges for us. Okay. Come on, Come on, Come on, yeah. The first challenge is we have to love like God did. Mm -hmm. An unconditional love. Meaning that doesn't matter how hard, much that person hurts you, no matter how mean that person was to you, no matter how prideful that person was to you, you still have to love them. The second thing is we must love our family the way that Jesus did. Mm, come on. And as you see that Jesus would go above and beyond for his family, that in his last breaths, he was, he was worried about his mother's well-being. Yeah. And the third thing is to love the lost like God did, like Jesus did, like the apostles did, like even a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament did. Mm. That they laid down their very life to seek and save the lost. And I, I'm here to tell us this morning that if we are willing to go into debt like that in our love, mm. that there's truly nothing Satan can do to stop us. Mm. We're, we're always going to be amazed at the miracles that God has for us. If we would just go into love debt like this. Mm -hmm. I love you all. And to God be all good.